Welcome to Ricky Lee Jones. It's uh, fabulous to talk to you and see you in the flesh. And we have a whole new album uh, coming up. But it's fantastic that you're so productive all these years down the track. Yes, and I feel like I had a long spell that was kind of dry. And then once that ended, I'm just on fire. <laughs> <laughs> with ideas <laughs> yes well the way uh, you're going about the songs on pieces of treasure i mean these are some beautiful songs that you're covering on this record uh yeah. how do you curate uh down to 10 songs mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got an ocean's worth of songs out there and you make it 10 how does that happen so i have a producer who knows my voice well and and he's very familiar with uh, who's covered these songs so you know we pick them according to first, if it seems like a thing I can do, then thematically, and um, then finally we record them and see if they come off the way we thought they would. I wanted to do a tune that was that goes, um, it's not You Came a Long Way from St. Louis, it's... Um, I don't know, but it's a it's it's a little bit of a, a cool attitude. He just put the kibosh, kibosh on that. He said, you are singing right from the source. He said, I know you like the way you sing that, but it's not real. And I was like, now that's a listener. And that's exactly because I would have gone, look at all the cool things I'm doing. <laughs> and that's exactly what I need. So he kept it on track. And uh it turned out to have a, a, you know, it's really like its own little personality, a flower all its own, I think. This uh, he that you speak of, uh, Russell yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> was the uh, very first producer that you had back on those first two albums. Uh, it's yeah. taken a long time for you two to get back together. Russ Tidelman was the co-producer with Lenny Warnker. And um, I first went to them because I loved the Randy Newman um, albums. And I thought, as a beginner, I thought, this is closest to what I do. I write stories, and and they have strings, and they have an oboe, and they're not afraid to use all different kinds of things when they draw or paint the song. Um, of course, I was turned out to be a very different kind of writer than Randy, but I made the right choice in finding them out. And Russ, of course, is a more prolific uh, producer than Lenny. Lenny kind of only works with Randy. He did a few other things, but Russ is always working with a wide variety of people and lives in New York. He goes out to see music every night. He knows everybody and everything that's going on there. So he's exactly the right guy to make a very special little jazz record, I think. He found this singer he wanted. She Absolutely. was looking down in New Orleans. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when uh, when that first record came out with Russ, um, and, you know, I'm I'm old enough to have been on the radio that year that uh, that brand new Ricky Lee Jones album came out in 1979. Uh, what an incredible record. And, you know, it wasn't just about Chucky's in Love on Australian radio. I think we played uh, Young Blood, Danny's All-Star Joint on a Saturday afternoon, 1963, Weasel, Coolsville. Uh, radio was very different then. Uh huh. Yes, it was, especially FM. I don't know if you guys have AM and FM, but especially back then, a disc jockey had power and he could play what he wanted to play, not just a playlist. And um, for a little while, you could hear radio that that was diverse. You know, eventually they got so genre oriented trying to sell that product that one radio station only played one kind of music over and over again. But when we were younger, you know, especially in the early 70s, um, FM played all kinds of things, or AM played all kinds of things, and then FM played a whole album for you. And um, it was luxurious. Too bad they don't have it now. But maybe they have it on, you know, maybe you can stream great radio. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It was an incredible chart at the end of the year. Uh, there's the Ricky Lee Jones album, the debut album from Ricky Lee Jones, the 1979 Australian end of year chart. Uh, and it, it went Super Tramp, ELO, Kiss, Rod Stewart, Billy Joel, uh, Bee Gees, Bob Seger, Leo Sayer, and then Ricky Lee Jones. 
Okay. <laughs> At number nine, ahead of Dire Straits, ahead of Blondie, ahead of Toto, ahead of Led Zeppelin, and Bob Dylan. <laughs> All right. You were very, you were very young. You must have been feeling like a pop star at that point. I was feeling like I was a pop star. No doubt, no doubt about it. That was my brief year <laughs> living dangerously. <laughs> Yeah, because you've told your story in the book, and you know it's uh, it's a it's a very confronting story. Uh, was that like therapy for you to write your biography? It was not. You know, I've been in therapy twenty years. It was not therapy, but um, it was it was to offer redemption for all of the dead people who lived great lives, but nobody would ever know their names from Peg Leg Jones and his wife, my father and our car trips. It was so visual and so cinematic. So I knew they would be good stories, but I also knew they wanted me to tell their stories, all of them. And, and um, once I had done it, I was free of them and I loved them, but I was free of all those ghosts and could tell my own story at last. Will it be a movie? Boy, I hope there'll be a TV show. That's what I'm working on. Yeah. Well, in fact, that... if you know any producers, I have a really great television idea. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and then they could produce it down under and then it could find its way to, it's a really great, it's from, taken from one of the chapters in the book and, and uh, it would be really good TV, so. I think there are many possibilities in that book. You could you could do, you know, the hitchhiking story or the Arizona. You know, there's a lot of great. I had an idea for a documentary about the horses. I thought I'd like to go to Australia and find out what that song means to people from the indigenous people to the people in Adelaide what is the deal with that song? What does it mean? And then see if some other story presents itself from finding out why the Australians love this song so much, you know? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I again, remember that song coming out when Daryl released it on his album. You'd had it out a year earlier on the yeah. Flying Cowboys album. Uh, but Daryl's version was the number one hit here. And it, it sort of came out, and like a lot of things, it it, it went away. And then um, I think my daughter might have been about uh, 15 at the time. Uh, we were out somewhere. Daryl came on and sang the horses in concert, and she just stood there. And I said, you know this song? And she said, everyone knows this song. <laughs> and it actually took off in another generation. Uh -huh. so, so people uh -huh. who are now in their 30s, that's like the classic for them. <laughs> just, it's a phenomenon. And, um, you know, when I wrote it, I wrote it for my daughter. It started when I was still pregnant, trying to imagine how would a child survive um, all this rock and roll show business. And if I wasn't there, how could I create an afterlife where the whole world would take care of her? And that's the phenomenon of this record, of this song, because it's almost like in Australia, the whole world does take care of her. They sing that song so loud. It's just overwhelming, but it it's like... What I had in mind when I wrote it, they they said, we hear you. It's wow. very moving for me. <laughs> I've, I've been following your posts in the recent weeks of uh, Harry Styles uh, performing yeah. around he Australia. When, when you first saw that, what did you think? Well, when I saw him, the somebody shared the first time he did it, and I thought two things. I went, he's singing that pretty good. And I thought, and listen to them. They're like yelling it. What? That's the way it's going to be. And I was just like, this is, this is like the national anthem. This is just like, why do they love singing this song? I don't know. But just between you and I, I thought Harry did a great job. He was really good.
as far as singing it, you know, that way, it was really good. Yeah. Um, that song was co-written with Walter, Walter Becker from uh, Stilly Dan. What was his part in the song? He was my producer um, on Flying Cowboys. And I had this, you know, I had this song and I said, I feel like it's just not going anywhere. And he listened. He said, well, what if you change the key in the chorus? This is, you know, I don't know music, so I don't know if it's a fourth or a seventh or eighth or a ninth, but th it's relative to the key. We can go here. And um, so he changes, which, you know, the chorus changes keys. And um, when he first did it, I, I, I didn't like it very much, but I wasn't going to say no to him because I knew he was a great writer. So I said, oh, okay, let's do that. And uh, that's that's what we did. Fabulous. And uh, you got to perform that song with Daryl when you were in Australia last. And that was the, that was the first time you ever met him too, wasn't it? It was. And we weren't great at it. You know, he has, he's, you know, it's high in his register. He does it really good, but I do it differently. And, um, and we were kind of on the spot. I don't think we did okay, but, it, but it wasn't a great um, exchange. I'm sure he feels the same way. But it was nice that uh, that we showed up for each other. Yeah. A little birdie tells me there are talks underway to have you down in Australia uh, over the next 12 months. Yes, I hope. I hope so. I mean, I'm torn between coming for this record and waiting, you know, to do a, a record of my own. But who knows how long that will take. But I'd like to come down soon. I well, like it there. have you back down here too. <laughs> Uh, Ricky, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks for talking about the record.